So good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for coming to uh, learn about dynamic digital radiography at this Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm John Sable, Clinical Research Manager at Kahn and Kimnolta Healthcare. And I'd like to thank you all for uh, taking time during this RSNA to come and learn about uh, dynamic digital radiography. Before Dr. Singh shares his uh, knowledge and experience on the clinical side of this, I'm just gonna give an introduction into the technology to try to ground you on how the system works. There will be time for questions at the end of the session, and we look forward to some uh, interaction that way. So just to start, I'd like to say that uh, all of the technology and the applications discussed and presented this afternoon are already 510K cleared for use in the United States. So traditionally, radiography has always meant acquiring a static image of the patient's anatomy. Functional information was the realm of other technologies, usually more complex and requiring moving the patient to that imaging device. With the advent of high efficiency digital detectors capable of very fast readout, we're able to acquire dynamic imaging, capturing patient motion with the same equipment in the same way that you would acquire a conventional static image. This enables us to observe anatomic and physiologic changes as they occur and offers the potential to improve the quality and efficacy of patient care. What is dynamic digital radiography? DDR is an advanced technique, as I said, cleared by the FDA in late 2018. It enables the acquisition of a series of static images at six or 15 frames per second over the full 17 by 17 inch field of view of a large format flat panel detector. With current implementation of this technology, the maximum acquisition time is 20 seconds in a given uh, exam. In addition to the highly efficient detector, we need an x-ray generator capable of pulsed, uh, very low dose exposures. For a 15 second, 15 frame per second chest acquisition, the typical dose is just over seven micrograys per image for a total of about one and a half milligray. The resulting image data sets are standard DICOM objects. They can be viewed on a PAX either as a cine loop or page through frame by frame. In addition, you can extract individual images for further analysis or to review just as you would a standard film. It's important to note that DDR is not fluoroscopy. Um, there's a few key differences. Number one is that there is a one to two second delay between start of the exposure and the time the first fully processed image is visible on the operator's console. DDR is also, as I said, limited to a maximum 20 second uh, exposure. You can program shorter ones, and of course the exposure will terminate any time the technologist releases the hand switch. Unlike fluoro, DDR has a large field of view. Dynamic exams can be acquired over the full detector, and usually at a lower dose than comparable fluoroscopy exams. Also, unlike fluoroscopy, it's important to note that the physician does not have to be in the room for the procedure. So this enables you to schedule it just as you would any static uh, conventional x-ray image. It's currently available on four different acquisition platforms from three different vendors. In addition to the conventional overhead room, it's available on floor-mounted straight and U-arms. And it's recently just been cleared by the FDA for use on a, uh, with a wireless detector on a mobile uh, setup so that you can image the patient at the bedside. With this variety of systems, you can image the patient wherever normal x-rays would be taken. DDR images are acquired, uh, as I said, on the same equipment as a standard x-ray, so you can really duplicate any of your standard x-ray views and exams. So here we show uh, a number of examples of lower extremity uh, exams. Patient on the far right has uh, patellofemoral mistracking on the right knee. The cervical spine is uh, probably where we've seen the fastest adopt adoption of this technology in the United States. Uh, the replacement of the lateral flexion extension exam is kind of a no-brainer in that you're giving the radiologist or the orthopedic surgeon all of the information they would normally have while at the same time being able to see the dynamic changes of the uh, patient's spine. You can also uh, duplicate any of the other standard uh, cervical spine views as well. The shoulder and upper extremity is where we've seen uh, a lot of traction. Dr. Eric Wagner and his colleagues at Emory University um, are using DDR daily in their assessment of their shoulder and wrist patients. 
Uh, DDR can aid in evaluation of all the entire, all aspects of motion in this complex joint. So in the case on the left, we see a patient with uh, textbook adhesive capsulitis. You can see that the scapula is moving perfectly synchronously with the humerus. On the right is a patient with glenohumeral OA. And the dynamic uh, imaging aids tremendously in the assessment of potential impingements and helps in the selection and evaluation of treatment for these patients. Here we have uh, two more cases of, uh, or two more images of a patient with adhesive capsulitis showing different views. The standard Grashy view on the left, and then the image on the right is showing both internal and external rotation at about 90 degrees of abduction. They found that DDR really helps enable assessment of uh, surgical outcomes. And this helps them do it in ways they couldn't do before. So all of the standard questions they would have, how is the joint moving? What is the scapular humeral motion? How's the glenohumeral motion interacting? What's the joint in rotation? Is there any impingements? Um, and how do these motions compare to the contralateral shoulder? DDR enables the surgeon to assess the outcome of their surgery dynamically, quantifying the motion and the, the function of the patient. It's also very useful in communicating to the patient what is going on either pre and post surgery. The patients really get a lot of uh, a great sense of their condition by being able to visualize what's going on. It's another case uh, in the wrist, scaphoid nonunion. Um, in the static image, it's a challenging diagnosis. The scaphoid bone is clearly fractured, but it's difficult to assess if it's displaced. There's not a definitive gap between the two components. And the distal pole of the scaphoid is, uh, it's hard to tell if it's significantly shifted relative to the proximal pole. However, in motion, it's very easy to see that this is, in fact, a uh, fully displaced fracture. In this way, DDR can help with uh, accurate, timely diagnosis and very efficient patient care. With all x-ray exams, dose is uh, very important, and we've assessed uh, dose in the shoulder patients at Emory comparing to published values for other exams. Uh, we looked at about 55 patients acquired, images acquired over the course of one month and compared that to published data on uh, conventional films, uh, arthrograms, and upper extremity CT. As you can see, the dose of uh, DDR is much more comparable to conventional x-ray. It's about 25% higher than a static film and about 40% lower than an arthrogram. The same way we looked at dose uh, for thoracic patients undergoing a sniff test at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, this is data showing uh, dosimetric data from the same four patients who underwent all four imaging uh, techniques. The average fluoro entrance dose ranged from 11 to 36 milligray with an average of 21. And the DDR dose for these, um, and this was done with the maximum 20 second uh, acquisition, it was about 1.7 milligray. The 12 second technique that Dr. Singh and his colleagues are currently using is about one and a half milligray. With DDR, we're getting not just images that we can visualize and see, but we're getting a whole suite of data. And this data enables us to do advanced analysis looking at the temporal changes in the x-ray signal over time. So we can uh, look at the changes in pixel intensity over the respiratory and cardiac cycles. Over respiration, the lungs expand, decreasing x-ray attenuation in a region-by-region -region basis. And with uh, the cardiac signal, the blood volume changes at, through the heartbeat. It's been reported due to, from MR studies that about 50% of the stroke volume is the blood volume change within the lungs over that cardiac cycle. So with dynamic x-ray, we can have an algorithm where we're looking at, for in this case, changes in the blood volume within the lungs. And we do this by segmenting out the lung areas, finding an ROI region over the cardiac uh, border where we can use this to assess the cardiac heart rate. We select a reference frame at end diastole. And then from that, we use a bandpass filter from our estimate of the cardiac rate to look at the signal changes associated with the heartbeat. And within each ROI, within the lung region, we can figure out how much the x-ray attenuation changes from image to image as we move away from end diastole. 
And we can replace, uh, we can generate a color map and use this to map that signal of X-ray intensity changes over the heartbeat. So what we're essentially seeing is a color representation of the change in blood volume with any one, within any small region in the uh, lungs. In an analogous way, we can do the same thing over the respiratory cycle and essentially create a map of how much the lung volume is changing region by region. What can we do with this information? Here we have a case from St. Mariana University Hospital. This is an ICU patient who is imaged with DDR on the mobile unit at the bedside. After about seven days in the ICU, uh, the respiratory condition worsened. And yet due to uh, his renal failure, pulmonary CT angiography was uh, contraindicated due to the iodinated contrast agent. So DDR was performed and it revealed that there is an area of focal under intensity, so area of low blood volume within the lungs. And this patient was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism. And I should emphasize that this exam is done at the bedside without any injected contrast agent. We're just looking at changes in the x-ray attenuation over time. It's another case from St. Mariana University in Japan. Uh, this is a severe COVID patient who on day two, the second from the left panel of images, underwent prone positioning therapy. And DDR, the ventilation images of DDR show that the ventilation was improving with this prone therapy, and this correlates with measurements from the ventilator. On uh, the eighth day of the exam, the, or of this patient's course, uh, the lung, lung ventilation started to decrease again. Dr. Singh uh, will talk more about this, and I think it, look forward to hearing him share more of his uh, experience and uh, knowledge of how DDR can be used clinically. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Satinder Singh of the Department of Radiology, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Dr. Singh completed his radiology residency at the All India Institute of Medical Science in New Delhi, and then subsequently at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He currently serves as the Chief of Cardiopulmonary Radiology, Director of their Cardiac CT. As a passionate educator, he's also co-director of their combined cardiopulmonary and abdominal imaging group fellowship program. And he's authored over 100 uh, papers and uh, look forward to hearing about his experience. I'm just going to add that sometime later this week, early next, uh, UAB will be undergoing their 1,000th patient uh, DDR exam. Dr. Singh. Thank you, John. Good morning, afternoon, transition, and welcome. So what I'm going to do is basically review what we have learned from DDR and also look at the current literature, which is not a whole lot uh, in this aspect. So these are my disclosures. And the objective, as I said, you know, we share our experience and uh, what are the potential research opportunity with DDR. So as we know, chest radiography is the mainstay of chest imaging for any chest or cardiac symptoms. And uh, ICU radiography is the main way to monitor ICU patients. Uh, in fact, the chest radiography almost uh, constitutes 30 to 40% of all X-ray exam performed. Uh, the main advantage, as we know, is speed in acquisition and interpretation, low cost, low radiation dose. So chest X-ray is the most versatile imaging for chest diseases. Uh, we talked about this, uh, not only anatomic information, but we get some physiologic information of the lung parenchyma, diaphragm, the perfusion and ventilation, and we talk about that in a few seconds. So here are the complications or applications of uh, DDR which we can use. Uh, in the lung parenchyma, any suspected lung nodule or focal abnormality, we can also use it for looking at adhesions in the chest wall pre or post operative, especially those patients who are undergoing VATS. A look at the diaphragm dysfunction. This is the one area of interest which we have done a lot. Uh, in cases of COPD and cystic fibrosis, effect of treatment uh, with DDR. And lastly, uh, ventilation perfusion imaging, which is upcoming. I think it has a potential role in certain aspects of uh, clinical uh, radiology. So here is an example of a patient who is status post heart transplant. These are immunocompromised patients. They do undergo radiographic evaluation uh, on a regular basis. 
And on this regular routine chest PN lateral view, uh, as we can see, there is a subtle nodular density which is projecting over this rib. We're not certain it's, it's true or this is vascular confluence shadow, uh, and we cannot see on the lateral view. So luckily this patient was still in house and we call him back, and we looked at this area with the DDR. And as you can see, this area, this nodule, seen on both uh, subtracted images, it is moving with the lung parenchyma, increasing our suspicion that yes, this is truly in the lung parenchyma. Because he is immunocompromised, so this led to further evaluation with the CT, and CT showed that this lesion was, in fact, present, and as you come here, right there. This is the area which was seen on the chest radiograph not seen in the lateral view. But in addition to that, this patient also had few other lesions in the paraspinal and as well as in the contralateral lung too. So we decided that this patient needs further evaluation. So he underwent CT-guided biopsy of this lesion. So the largest lesion, which was in the paraspinal region, not seen on the radiograph because of the location. Uh, we did the biopsy and it turned out this was a necrotizing granulomatous infection due to cryptococcosis. So this is important. This patient was asymptomatic immunocompromised, and we were able to detect it and then finally make a diagnosis. So it changed the management of this patient. Uh, we all have seen th these kind of cases, nipple shadows, you know, if they are symmetrical, it's very easy to confirm, yeah, this is nipple shadow, but if it is on one side, sometimes it is difficult. Their location is typically around fifth or sixth rib anteriorly, but if you do DDR and you can clearly see the nipple shadows here, they do not move with the regular lung motion. So this confirm that this is outside the patient, confirming that this is nipple shadow. So in one examination, you can do it. Otherwise, sometimes you have to do a nipple shadow in nipple ring, you know, marker a repeat examination, which we don't have to do if you're doing DDR. Now, he, this is a very interesting case. A patient who has a known right upper lung cancer, very speculated nodule, non-calcified nodule, very worrisome from imaging point of view. And this patient had a pre-operative DDR, post-operative at one week and then at one month. So here is the first DDR. Uh, it's very hard to even look at where exactly is the nodule, but when the lungs move, you can see this nodule here is the real thing, which corresponds to this nodule. This is the superior segment of the right lower lobe. So DDR helps in localizing and confirming our suspicion, which sometimes can be missed. So this is an important area of uh, diagnosing a certain lesion. At one month after right lower lobectomy, you can see there is a large hydro nematorax on the right. And as you can see, the pleural line, which is very clearly seen as the lungs move in and out during inspiration and expiration. Sometimes this can be relatively subtle and difficult to detect. Uh, and also note that the lung parenchyma itself is not moving at one week after surgery. But at one month interval, now the hydronemothorax has gone. There is a post-lobectomy change in the right lower lobe, and the lung is constantly moving normally as it should be. So I think it has a role in perioperative evaluation, uh, preoperative localized lesion, and there may be adhesions. You can find part of the lung which is not moving correctly before doing the VATS procedure, and also postoperatively looking at the uh, status of the diaphragm as well as the lung parenchyma. Moving on to diaphragm, as we know, diaphragm is a major muscle organ in the thorax, separating the abdominal cavity and the thorax. It is muscular in majority of the lateral two-third of the portion, and it has a central, more fibrous, tendinous portion, central tendon. It has a posterior attachment via the two diaphragmatic cruces, and lateral, there are median and lateral arcuate ligaments. Uh, anterior laterally attaches to the ribs and sternum, uh, it is supplied by the C3 to C5 phrenic nerves, and which courses on both sides of the heart in the mediastinum and supply the diaphragm. Uh, its main function is in the uh, ventilation. So when the diaphragm contract along with the accessory muscles, sternocleidomastoid, scalene, and the external intercostal, it expands the thoracic cavity. That leads to expansion of the lungs, negative pressure increases, air goes into the lung. So that's a normal inspiratory effort. During expiration, diaphragm just relaxes, and there is a passive exhalation of the air out of the lung. In addition to ventilation, it also aids in emesis, urination, defecation, re re preventing reflux. We have all experienced at some point in time going to the bathroom, having difficulty. 
going through, you contract your diaphragm. So that's his, another function. So what can go wrong with the diaphragm? Uh, this picture is a nice depiction of what can be the causes. The cause can be in, within the central nervous system in the brain parenchyma due to a stroke or patients who have multiple sclerosis. So the motor neurons are affected. Or it can be within the spinal cord where uh, the spinal cord is affected by polio or ALS, et cetera. Or third course would be the phrenic nerve itself, which is affected. Either it is cut during surgery, coronary artery bypass surgery, or infiltrated by the tumors, or compressed by the lymph node and large lymph node in the mediastinum, or it, the diaphragm may not move appropriately because the lungs are too hyper-expanded, as we see in severe emphysema or severe asthma. And lastly, the problem could be within the diaphragm muscle itself. It can be uh, atrophic. It's, Several muscular dystrophies can cause that. Patients on long-term steroid can lead to myopathy, myasthenia gravis, et cetera. They can all affect. So depending on the cause, the effect on the diaphragm is variable. Uh, what it leads to is basically weakness of the diaphragm or paralysis. Weakness is that diaphragm is not moving completely. Paralysis, they're not moving at all. So it can be unilateral or bilateral. Paralysis is often unilateral, and it is mostly due to trauma or tumor or infection. The last thing is the eventuration, which is a congenital abnormality of diaphragm, which we'll come to uh, in a minute to discuss what exactly it is. So what could be the symptoms from diaphragmatic dysfunction? It can be dyspnea, shortness of breath, even at rest, as well as during exercise. The performance, exercise performance of the patient is decreased. They tend to become more fatigued and have develop recurrent pneumonia because diaphragm is not moving well. It does not move around the mucus, so it leads to more propensity for infection. Since the symptoms become more prominent during the supine position, these patients do have trouble sleeping well, and that leads to hypersomnia, decreased quality of life. We all know, you know, if you don't sleep well, you cannot work properly. Uh, and one important thing is the way to diagnose that your diaphragm may not be functioning. If you go to the pool, and you'd become more short of breath, that indicates that you are not able to move your diaphragm or accessory muscles, because in the pool, in submerged post portion, these symptoms become more prominent, okay? And PFT, if you do, these are usually restrictive PFT. Severity is more with the bilateral disease, and it's more in supine rather than erect position. Uh, so how we diagnose diaphragmatic dysfunction? Majority of the time, or I would say many of the time, uh, diaphragm, evaluation or detection is incidental. If you do a chest radiograph, one diaphragm is elevated. Or you do a CT, diaphragm is elevated. Patient is asymptomatic. So this is one way of diagnosing that something is wrong with the diaphragm. Could be anywhere from brain to the diaphragm itself. Or the patient can be symptomatic. Now, when they are symptomatic, symptoms are nonspecific. Disney on exertion is the most common. So you have to rule out other causes, common causes of respiratory diseases uh, and if you don't find anything, then you pay attention that this could be diaphragmatic dysfunction, which is causing symptoms. So to further evaluate that, you have to do some kind of imaging. So the imaging is usually start with a chest x-ray, uh, which is a static, or you can do a, some kind of dynamic imaging, which is required to see whether diaphragm is motion or not. Uh, routinely, it is chest fluoroscopy or a chest ultrasound, which can be done. Chest ultrasound is more popular in Europe, not very commonly done in this country. In this country, it is mostly chest fluoroscopy. Uh, PFTs are done to look at the what kind of pattern of obstruction or restrictive is there. And if you want to confirm, you can do a phrenic nerve stimulation test. So chest fluoroscopy, since it's the gold standard so far in this country, we usually do this in an erect position. And it is very easy to do and easy to interpret. And there's a good inter-observer variability, although it can be very subjective and operator dependent. We have seen inexperienced people, they've put the paddle for fluoroscopy and they can expose the patient radiation a lot. That's why if you saw the John's uh, slide, radiation exposure from the chest fluoroscopy are so variable depending upon the experience. Uh, it does involve uh, radiation and also it can be challenging if the patient has bilateral disease because you don't have something to compare, right? In those situations, it is preferred that you do a fluoroscopy in supine decubitus position. That way, you, the portion of the lung which is down dependent, it will not move as much as 
to the contralateral side so you can see the difference more obviously. So how it is done, preferred technique is erect PA and lateral, move the hands above up your head for frontal and in front of it from the lateral so it don't cross the chest wall. Ask the patient to take a normal breath and then a deep breath and then do the sniffing. Sniffing is basically sniffing through the nose multiple times. And maybe you can practice before doing fluoroscopy so you, know, you don't expose the patient too much. So what could be the result of sniff test? Normal, both diaphragm moves normally in both uh, inspiration and expiration and they are negative on sniff test that they move in symmetrical direction with sniffing. If it is paralyzed, the unilateral diaphragm, which is elevated, it does not move, and with sniffing, it will show paradoxical movement. It will go other way as compared to the normal lung. Uh, when it is weak, the diaphragm don't move that much, and with sniffing, it may or may not show paradoxical motion. So this area of weakness is kind of sometimes confused with paralysis. I have seen people calling a weak diaphragm total paralysis. So that should be noted. Now, we commonly now do a diaphragmatic evaluation for any patients who are undergoing lung transplant. So this is a patient with the COPD and bilateral lower dominant interstitial lung disease. And we did a DDR and look at the diaphragm, did the sniff test, and diaphragm is moving normally. So we don't have to do a sniff test and a chest radiograph separately. We can just do a DDR, look at the lung parenchyma, discover any kind of tumor or abnormality which should be noted before patient undergoes surgery. So based on that, we said, okay, let's compare the radio regular chest fluoroscopy with DDR and see uh, can it give us the same information or something extra. So we looked at retrospectively almost 60 cases where patients had both chest fluoroscopy and DDR, and we found that the both modalities have a good agreement uh, with kappa of 0.75, determining the paradoxical motion. And in determining the right hemidiaphragm, kappa was higher as compared to the left side. We do not know the reason, but we will investigate further. This abstract will be presented at STR next year in Charleston. So with this uh, limited study, what we found that DDR can perform equally well. So in fact, based on all this data, we are transitioning from chest fluoroscopy to DDR starting uh, January of 2023 for looking at diaphragmatic dysfunction. What is diaphragmatic evanturation? It is a congenital weakness or incomplete muscularization of the lateral portion of the diaphragm. So it is replaced by a thin membrane sheet and with time that thin membrane sheet becomes more stretched and it moves upward with normal abdominal pressures. So normally, majority of the time, it is a partial eventuation. That means the entire diaphragm is not involved, but it can be total eventuation. Here is an example of a right hemidiaphragm elevation on the lateral view. You can see the anterior portion of the diaphragm is elevated, whereas the posterior portion is normal. So if you do a motion dynamic study, this portion will move normally, where the eventuated portion will be weaker, and it may or may not show the paradoxical motion. And on the CT, sometime on the right side, the liver can protrude through this uh, weak diaphragm, and it can look like a Watto from the Star Wars head. So here is a good example of a diaphragmatic weakness. Uh, as you can see, uh, this diaphragm is moving as relatively less as compared to the left side. And with sniffing, it is going in the wrong direction. So it is a positive sniff test, but if you look Carefully in the back, this portion, that portion is the posterior hemidiaphragm which moves normally. So that you can see on the frontal view, but if you do a lateral DDR2, you will see clearly the posterior portion is moving, anterior portion is not, so this is a classical eventuation. Paralysis, easy to diagnose, elevated, positive sniff test. You can look at the uh, motion as well as amplitude, how diaphragms are moving. And then weakness, this patient has a very severe COPD. And you can see when he's trying to do sniff test, he's using all his accessory muscles. You know, you can see the shoulders are moving, stomachal mastoid contracting, and diaphragms are not moving much. The right is worse than left, as this is the purple line is the right side. So how the diaphragm paralysis is treated? Uh, it is, if it is asymptomatic and it's unilateral, usually no treatment is required. Uh, but if the patient is symptomatic, uh, then there are two options. If the phrenic nerve is intact, you can do pacing. 
Basically, just like a heart pacer, this is a diaphragmatic stimulus uh, device. You put a pacer lead or wire on the phrenic nerve and stimulate. It, you have a control outside how to stimulate. Uh, that is the diaphragmatic pacing. And it's a very minimally invasive procedure done through the video-assisted uh, thoracoscopic surgery. The other option is the, if the phrenic nerve is not, is compromised, you can do plication. What that means is basically folding the, the, folding the diaphragm, which is paralyzed, and kind of stretching it out. So what it does is it increases the thoracic cavity, it allows the lungs to expand more, so it increases the oxygenation, improves the oxygenation, so it decreases the symptoms. So here are two different uh, patients, different examples. Uh, this is a young patient who uh, suffered injury to the spinal cord playing football. He was a high school student, very unfortunate, and he was paralyzed, uh, quadriplegic. And he's on ventilator dependent, and now he underwent pacing on both the diaphragms. So he came for looking at the effects of the pacing. So we did the regular uh, fluoroscopy with this, uh, sorry, DDR, and uh, you can see with the pacing off, uh, the diaphragm, both diaphragms are moving, but they are weak. They are not moving that much. But when you switch the pacer on, the motion of the diaphragm is much improved. It's not a dramatic, it's not going to go back to normal, but it will improve. And that little improvement makes some major differences in these patients who cannot really breathe properly without ventilation. Here, example of a plication, elevated diaphragm, and actually you can see this diaphragm is paralyzed, and you, paralyze, you do the plication, there's an increased soft tissue here, this is the folded diaphragm toward the chest wall, the whole lung volume is improved, so that's why it increases the oxygenation, because there is more lung to do that function. Now with the DDR, you can also see the airways, not only larger airway, but also small airway. Here is a patient with cystic fibrosis, young patient, hyperinflated lungs and central bronchitis. And if you look at these uh, airways, these are the bronchi on the cross-sectional. They expand with inspiration and decrease with expiration. You can really see them quite well. And also we can look at the larger airway. This patient has a severe tracheomalacia. You can see on the lateral view. You have to do a lateral view to de determine this information. You will not see on the AP view. Uh, the trachea is significantly narrow. This is the definition of tracheomalacia. Some say more than 50%, some say it's more than 70%. But regardless, this is almost 80, 90%. This is severe tracheomalacia. Uh, different patient, you can do the dynamic CT. It'll show same. This is a severe tracheomalacia. Both of these patients underwent bronchoscopy and it was confirmed. Now, what about the research? There's the research on the diaphragmatic motion on these patients. Uh, this is a study done on 174 healthy volunteer uh, where they asked the patient to take a deep breath in the standing position. What they found is that the left diaphragm normally shows higher excursion and motion speed. This is a normal population. This is important information. The patients who have a higher BMI and who have a larger chest cavity with larger vital capacity, they also have increased excursion and faster motion of the diaphragm. So left side moves more, and it is more in patients who are obese and have a larger thoracic cavity. Now how it applies to patients who have COPD. In COPD patients, the, there is a larger excursion of the diaphragm and faster peak velocity or motion during the resting breathing motion. Okay, very important. And this is what they say is that the diaphragm is trying to compensate for the desaturation these patients have because the oxygenation is not happening. The diaphragm is trying to move faster to allow more oxygenation. But what happened with exercise, this leads to decreased excursion as well as velocity. So with exercise, these patients become very, very symptomatic, short of breath very quickly. And this is the reason what happens. All right, there is a little bit of research correlating the pulmonary function test with the DDR. Uh, in this one study, you can actually draw the surface area of the lung from the DDR, and this is the projected lung area, and compare with certain PFT parameters, such as uh, vital capacity and FEV1. And uh, in this paper, it showed a moderate correlation, uh, R value of 0.65 and 0.44. Not a great, but I think there's a potential. Once we tweak this technique and 
look at more larger data population, you may be able to see that there is a good correlation, and it might be useful information when patients who where you cannot do the detailed PFTs. Okay, so this can provide you that information. Uh, what about effect of treatment in patients with COPD? Uh, uh, this is a 53-year-old male. Uh, the right, the left column uh, shows before treatment, and the right column is with treatment. And this is the projected lung area. Uh, you can see clearly on the projected lung area, after three months of bronchodilator therapy, the expiratory lung volumes are decreased. That means patient is able to expire more. Uh, and this chart shows that before treatment is the red area and the blue is the uh, after treatment. So you can see an objectively effect of your treatment in these patients. Otherwise, you will be basically doing the PFTs and clinically judging. But in addition to clinical, you can visually localize, see what is the effect of treatment. And same can be done with cystic fibrosis. Uh, this is a recent paper published earlier this year uh, from Tom uh, Fitzgerald in UK uh, group. They looked at uh, cystic fibrosis, 20 cystic fibrosis cases who have an acute exacerbation. And they did a spirometry and DCR. They called it DCR, so digital dynamic radiography or chest radiography. And uh, did the physiotherapy on these patients and repeated the both. So what they found is the hemidiaphragm speed as well as the change in the projected, projected lung area they improved after treatment, and yet you can see on the DDR images. And the rate of change of PLA at full expiration improved from 42 to 52. And these objective criteria with DDR were correlated with the spirometry data. So why is it important? DDR, as we know, you just perform the study remotely, right? You don't have to be there. For spirometry, you have to be present by the bedside. You have to do that. Uh, and Patients who have transmittable respiratory infections, like in pandemic, you know, you don't want to be near the patient. You can do DDR and drive some kind of functional information from the DDR and prevent exposure to these pathogens. So that's an important area. Uh, hopefully we don't have to encounter this again, but just in case, it can be very useful. Lastly, VQ research. I think this is a very potential area. Remember, we are just looking at the radiographs. This is DDR. We are not giving contrast. We are not doing anything else. This is not cross-section imaging. Basic DDR. This is a case report published in uh, uh, 2021 in European Heart Journal. 74-year-old male who had an exertional dyspnea. Uh, on the chest radiograph, it shows unilateral oligemia on the left side. I don't have the uh, radiograph. But when we did the uh, DDR, this is the ventilation images, and you can see it is a symmetrical color coding on both sides. So the ventilation is totally normal. But when you look at the perfusion imaging, there is hardly any perfusion on the affected left side. And uh, this was confirmed at the scintigraphy, and patient had CT imaging, and the, what they found is there is an aneurysmal dilatation of the left main pulmonary artery, which has a thrombus totally occluding that pulmonary artery. It was underlying due to underlying joint cell arthritis. I'm not saying it is going to replace CT, but it can help you derive. Remember, you're doing a DDR, just chest x-ray. If you can look at this information in addition to the lung parenchyma, you can point in the right direction right away. You know? This is another case report. I think this, pair, this group has published a larger series in patients who had a chronic pulmonary trauma embolism. They did a before end arterectomy and after end arterectomy. The top series is before and below is the after. So before end arterectomy, pulmonary scintigraphy showed that multiple perfusion defects on both sides, okay? DDR images also correspondingly show hypoperfusion in the same areas. And the catheter and geography also showed the vascularity in the areas, uh, same areas is decreased due to chronic PEs. Uh, after the end arterectomy, the perfusion in the affected area has increased, and there is a compensatory decrease in the normal areas because more blood is now going to the affected area, which has now opened up. And you can see the exact information on the DDR and catheter and geography. Again, a very potential useful application. It needs a much larger population to evaluate, but this can be a game changer to a certain extent very invis minimally invasive technique without any contrast, you can get this information from just chest x-ray. So based on that, we looked at uh, 
perfusion of the lung parenchyma in patients who are undergoing surgery. So that all these patients have a nuclear scan to look at the lung perfusion. Uh, patients who are undergoing lung transplant, they want to see which lung is poorly perfused, so they will transplant that lung first if he's getting a one lung transplant. So we looked at uh, almost 29 patients uh, this earlier this year. Uh, they all had scintigraphy, which is required, and we also did DDR. So DDR was done within seven months of scintigraphy because lung transplant is not available right away, so these tests can be quite variably apart. They are not done within days. So we looked at the percent diffusion of each lung and as well as the different portion of the lung in the same patient. So when you do the DDR perfusion imaging, uh, important to remember that this should be done with a breath hold, not when the patient is moving. So you have to ask the patient to breath hold the breath so it will not, the ventilation portion will not uh, dirty the perfusion aspect. So then you will derive the dynamic perfusion imaging and from that you can get the quantitative perfusion images with the color coding and ultimately this will give you the global perfusion map. So these are the numbers for the global right lung and the global left lung perfusion. And then you can divide the lung into upper, mid, and lower, and it, you can get a derived different perfusion densities from all three. So this is what we did in these patients. What we found was there was no discrepancy between these two modalities. Only very short pilot study, 29 patients, and there was a good statistically good correlation between those things. This is a case example of this case. Pre-lung transplant, nuclear perfusion study done. The left lung is hypoperfused. Uh, the left lung is red here. It is 35% perfusion as compared to the right lung, which is green, 65%. On DDR, the right lung, which was 65 on nuclear scintigraphy, it showed 68% on perfusion DDR. And uh, which was left lung, which was 35, it is 32 on DDR. It's very close. Now remember, DDR is done erect. Scintigraphy is done flat, supine. So there is some gravitational effect. So that may be one part why we have slight discrepancy. And we are doing a study to look at, you know, if the DDR and supine position match more accurately with the scintigraphy. So this patient underwent the left lung transplant because that was the one which is uh, hyperperfused. And the post-lung transplant, you can see the perfusion on both lungs is almost equal. So there is a good correlation, and I think this is a very good... Uh, application of DDR in pre-surgical, mostly lung transplant patient, uh, this can actually replace scintigraphy once we have a large data. I mean, one test is totally gone. All these patients get chest x-ray, right? They do get diaphragmatic evaluation, uh, uh, fluoroscopy. So if you just do DDR with the technique, you can get that information, diaphragm information and perfusion all in one with very low radiation dose. So, in conclusion, DDR improves visibility of lung abnormality, whether it's nodule or subtle airspace disease, and increases our confidence in making the diagnosis. It provides excellent evaluation of the diaphragm function and can easily replace chest fluoroscopy, as it will be done at UAB, uh, with less radiation, uh, less subjective variability, and you don't have to be physically present. If you have an outpatient clinic like we have, we have to be there to do chest fluoroscopy. Now, if you just DDR, these images will come to your pack. You can look at it and do right. You can make the diagnosis. Uh, there is a potential for correlating the functional data from DDR with the PFD and its effect on treatment, especially in patients with COPD and cystic fibrosis. Um, and as I said before, in patients where you don't want to be close to that because of the infection, DDR can provide some useful information. It will not replace the dedicated PFT, but it will give you some idea of their functions. And as uh, John mentioned, advanced computer analysis of the perfusion and ventilation application. We are looking at the perfusion applications right now. Ventilation is slightly more tricky because we have seen cases of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, very, very marked air trapping on CT. And we did a DDR, we could not detect any perfusion, uh, ventilation abnormality. So I think the ventilation aspect is less sensitive in detecting smaller uh, air trapping as compared to perfusion, which is much more sensitive. Uh, initially, we had a workflow issues because it take longer, these images, to 
Once you take it, it has to go to the workstation, and technologists have to sit down and process the images, and then they'll go to your packs. It almost takes almost 30 minutes for one radiograph, and that could affect your workflow. But uh, with the upgrade, the middle portion, the technology sitting there was eliminated, so now the images, once you take it, they go through that workstation and directly go to your packs. Although it has decreased the time, but it still takes some time. It's not just regular radiograph, because you remember, it takes almost 300 exposures. So you have to process the 300 exposures. So that's the time it takes for the computer. Once the computers are faster, which are happening more and more, you know, this time will go further down. And with that, I thank you very much. And I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues and uh, technologists at uh, our area. And uh, I would be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, go up to the microphone and feel free to ask. Hi, nice talk. Um, I just was curious, I don't know if I did misunderstand you. In the last case you showed, uh, you can make a correlation between um, nuclear medicine and the, and the plain uh, X-ray, and uh, giving us some information of lung perfusion, right? Right. So um, how do you can do this correlation? Is because you are not injecting contrast. So it's because there's a correlation between um, uh, ventilation and you extrapolate that perfusion, or is there anything I missed? No, the, so uh, when you do the perfusion scan before, they just inject the contrast, right? They're looking at the perfusion. So you are just looking at the perfusion nuclear scintigraphy, and here we are doing the perfusion aspect in a breath hold to look at the perfusion defects. We are not looking at the ventilation. We're just looking at the perfusion. So apples to apples, we're trying to do that same, except that this is erect and this is refined right now. So you extrapolate some so ventilation defects, you assume, are perfusion defects, right? Well, we are not looking at the ventilation perfusion defect. We are looking at the global perfusion of the lung parenchyma. These are the patients who are undergoing lung transplant. They can have a atypical or unilateral interstitial lung disease or COPD. So we, we, VQ is not a problem here. This is not PTE cases. These are non-PTE cases who are undergoing lung transplant. PTE don't require lung transplant unless it's end stage which has leads to cord pulmonale. That's a different story. So this is only the lung parenchymal diseases, not vascular. Okay, thank you. <laughs>